We are creatures of desire. What we most desire is meaning. What makes us suffer most is a lack of meaning. The Meaningful Life with Andrew G. Marshall. Marital therapist, author, and communications trainer Andrew G. Marshall invites guests from all walks of life to discuss what makes life meaningful. Hello, I'm Andrew G. Marshall. Welcome to The Meaningful Life. We're available on Apple, Spotify, Podbeam, and wherever you find your podcasts. My mother believed there were three things you should not discuss in public. Money, politics, and sex. In my therapy room, my clients are happy to discuss money and politics, and they're getting more relaxed talking about sex, as long as it stays in relatively safe waters frequency and sexual functioning issues, for example, achieving an orgasm or maintaining an erection. Since I've moved to Germany, they bring issues like, should we open up our relationship? But when it comes to talking about what turns them on, even with their partners, the shutters come down. It's a pity because to keep your sex life alive, you need to address this topic from time to time, particularly because otherwise sex can become stale. But more importantly, because our tastes change as we move through life, we don't just go to the same restaurants, holiday destinations, or listen to the same music. So why do we do the same old, same old in the bedroom, or anywhere else we might choose to have sex? My witness is Jungian analyst Dr Douglas Thomas, and we're going to take a deep dive into the world of transgressive sex. I can imagine my mother spinning in her grave. He's the author of The Deep Psychology of BDSM and Kink, Jungian and Archetypal Perspectives on the Soul's Transgressive Necessities and How Transgressive They Are. I quote from the book, The drama of BDSM emerges through scenes, and what stories they tell. Tales of shadowy subterranean spaces, dungeons, cages, shackles, chains, ropes, whips, Vloggers, instruments of abuse and torture, naked bodies, faceless hooded figures, forbidding, fierce beings of power and control, and otherworldly silhouettes of base submission. They are tales of intense, contradictory emotions and sensations, fear and desire, restriction and liberation, torment and delight, humiliation and exhilaration, devotion and dread. We're in some pretty powerful territory here. So, Douglas, what made you decide to write the book? Hi, Andrew. There are a couple of factors that went into deciding to write this book. One of the first ones, of course, which people are always curious about when they talk to me about this book, is that, yes, I have had my own personal experiences with BDSM and kink, which were very powerful, very meaningful and transformative for me. So I became more curious about what has been written psychologically about it. And when I looked into that, I found there was really very little coming from the Jungian world, which struck me as a shame because Jung was so interested in archetypes and archetypal experience. And it struck me just on the face value of it that the SM is deeply engaged with archetypes and archetypal figures, but so many of the scenes that are enacted look very similar to situations that we see in some of the more extreme myths and legends from around the world. We can get into talking more about that overlap later on. And the intensity of the emotions that are released is really, you know, one of the calling cards of archetypal experience. I checked with a colleague of mine who is fairly well known in the Jungian world, and he agreed there really has been very little that has been written from a Jungian perspective about BDSM and kink. And he referred to what he called the yuck factor. He (laughs) he thought Jungian analysts were squeamish and, you know, would prefer to stay away from this territory. It's a kind of peculiar thing because if you look at world mythology and legends, these other examples of archetypal reality, uh, you look at alchemy, which was uh, a point of such great fascination for Jung. It's extremely violent. And there's a lot of imagery that is difficult to stomach. So I'm not sure why, when it comes to actually enacting some of these 
patterns sexually in a way that's more embodied and erotic, people get more squeamish about it. But to answer your question, I realized that there was just a lack of information where I thought, you know, Jung had something to say about this. And did James Hillman, who was, you know, one of the leading psychologists in the generation after Jung, he trained with Jung in Zurich, was the first director of the Jung Institute in Zurich after Jung. And he developed archetypal psychology, which also provides a really fascinating perspective that can shed some light on why BDSM is so meaningful and so powerful psychologically. So I think for all these reasons, I saw there was a need for this book to generate some curiosity on the part of Jungian-based analysts so that they can be more welcoming and hopefully more competent in working with people that are exploring BDSM and kink. And for people who are practitioners of BDSM, that they would be able to develop a psychological language that would help them to understand on a deeper level why these experiences are so powerful and transformative. So let's start with some definitions. First of all, what are we meaning by BDSM? And what's the difference between BDSM and kink and fetish, which is another word that's often gets thrown into this mix as well? Can you help us? Yes, I certainly can. So BDSM is an abbreviation which developed around the 1980s, according to the Oxford English Dictionary. And it stands for bondage and discipline, domination and submission, and sadism and masochism. Some people will say that the SM stands for slave and master also. But I think more typically we say it's sadomasochism. Back in the, the 70s, SM was much more common as the reference or the moniker. But BDSM started to incorporate these other elements, which describe a range of practices and activities that combine erotic play with some expression of an extreme imbalance in authority and power. Now, there are some people who will say, we used to call it power exchange or total power exchange in the most extreme cases. And then some people said, look, that's not quite right because we never actually give up our power. If you think about power as life force, we, we always are in possession of our life force. And, and this is expanding on the definition a bit, but the elements of consent and negotiation are absolutely critical to the contemporary understanding of what we mean by BDSM. This is what distinguishes it from forms of abuse and physical harm and assault and rape and these other social transgressions, which are really not part of what BDSM is about. BDSM involves scenes that are consensual and negotiated. So let's see. Then kink is a broader umbrella term that refers to a range of erotic, I would say erotic activities and interests that can involve different forms of fantasy play and imagination connected with sexual play. Now, there is some overlap with fetish, so it does get confusing. But if we speak about fetish in a purely clinical sense, you know, you can look at the Diagnostic Statistic Manual of the American Psychiatric Association and I think this definition carries over to Europe as well, although I'm, I'm less well-versed in the European manual. But it refers to an erotic fixation so that in its most, what I want to say, common form, that it would refer to eroticizing specific body parts. And this starts to reveal some of the, the normative underpinnings of diagnosis in general. That if you look in the manual, it will say it eroticizes specific body parts other than breasts or genitalia. So there's a very high level of normativity behind the definition, right? So if you're eroticizing an elbow or a foot or an earlobe, then we're into something that would be considered a paraphilia. But if we're eroticizing breasts or genitalia, we're considered healthy and normal. So I think in, in the 21st century, we're opening up to a broader perspective on, you know, 
what brings people sexual pleasure and not pathologizing it if it's what traditionally was called non-normative. And fetish actually has its origin, the word, in religious ideas, doesn't it? Can you help us with that yeah. too? I'm so glad that you're including that. I was looking forward to getting into that with you. Historically, you know, if you go to a museum of natural history anywhere in the world, you will probably find a case somewhere that has small objects that used to be objects of religious worship, and they're called fetishes. So they could refer to the lesser deities or sacred objects that would be used in ritual and ceremony. But it did then make this jump over into a clinical term for where an eroticized object takes on, you know, what Jung would have called numinous power, N numinous referring to something that is divine, but also magical. mysterious. Yes, exactly. Magical, powerful, right? And sometimes overwhelming. And in a way, I think the idea of fetish is actually helpful for a lot of people because it's quite difficult to get out of the everyday world of paying bills, answering emails and cooking the kids tea into the sexual world. And fetishes that sort of help carry you from one world into the other, you know, if it's feet or particular items of clothing or something, actually helps in that transition. It has a certain power to transform. Yeah. That's a, a great point. And I think that you're also touching touching on two important things from a Jungian perspective. You know, the, the first one is that Jung, in my opinion, really did more than perhaps any other early psychologist to create a space within the field of psychology for what he called the religious function, the religious function of the psyche. And so he was able to take religiosity out of the realm of theology and treat it as a psychological issue. And so the religious function of the psyche continues to operate regardless of what religious beliefs one holds, or if, if one is an atheist or agnostic, it's fine. You still are going to be under the sway of the religious function of the psyche, which is to say that there will be things that take on a sacred dimension in your life, and you will be pulled with a sense of fascination towards those things. And sometimes those things are sexual. <laughs> and that's exactly right, that sex and numinosity are very much intertwined. And Jung was very clear about this. So I think that's one thing. And then the other thing that you're, you're bringing in is the element of the theatrical. And that's not to say that we're putting on a show or that we're creating a performance for anybody's entertainment other than our own. But the sense of theatricality that we can experiment and explore and play with identity, that sometimes clothing, gear, accoutrement, all help us to get into a headspace where we're exploring a different side of who we are. And I think as your introduction, you know, very touchingly and beautifully introduced it, these elements are often taboo because of the way that we are raised, where it's considered off limits. And we think, good Lord, what would my parents say if they saw me now? And that's something that we work through in terms of becoming a more whole and complete person within the Jungian model of psychological development. And I think there's a, a great fear of a lot of people if they tell their partner, you know, for example, I like rubber, that they're going to laugh or they're going to be horrified. And that just creates such a barrier. So, you know, one of the reasons I'm doing this discussion is to try and sort of normalize all of these things and to say that actually it's okay. And in fact, what your book is saying is not only is it okay, but it's a, a sort of a, a key to unlock. And here's a word that you use in your title I want to go into. It can unlock your soul. Now, what are you meaning by soul and how is the soul involved in these scenes? In ancient Greece, the word psyche meant both mind and soul. And in the writing of Jung, I'm sorry, yes, in the writing of Jung and Freud, they both will use the word 
the German word Seele, as well as psyche, almost interchangeably. When their works got translated into English, it was much more common to use psyche and mind, and soul was less commonly referenced or used as a word for translation. James Hillman, in particular, came back to psyche as soul to make the point that modern psychology has really neglected the concept. We've tended to biologize the mind, and the mind and the brain are not the same thing. And the soul brings back a sense of something that is poetic and metaphorical and non-literal, and that is really truly the domain of the psyche. It also brings back a sense of the mythic and the classical imagination. Soul has a lot to do with imagination. Hillman was very interested in the idea that what we suffer from so often in modern life is a failure of imagination and a loss of soul. How true. Now, he also said he also said that it's a deliberately ambiguous concept, which is very difficult <laughs> for our, you know, our fondness for the literal and to be specific and exact. And you can see this in the field of, of mental health. More and more, we're under a tremendous amount of pressure to prove that what we are doing with people is effective. And the best way that we know to try and prove that we're having a positive causal effect on people and their mental health is to measure to come up with metrics, metrices that are observable, measurable, quantifiable, repeatable. And this is the heart of evidence-based practice. But this is actually very inimical to the life of the soul, which deals with ambiguity and ambivalence and vagueness and that that is also a really important part of psychological life, because with Jung and Hillman and Freud and this whole field that is part of what today we call depth psychology, the notion of the unconscious is regarded as the factor that is the most decisive in influencing our behavior, our thoughts, our personalities in conscious life. It's, it's not so much that the ego is in charge, the ego pretends to be in charge, because that's what it needs to do in, in order for us to get through the world. But they all believe that it's the unconscious that is the decisive factor. And so the word unconscious is almost interchangeable with the word soul and imagination and psyche in this particular tradition. So what you're saying is our sexual fantasies are nothing to be ashamed of, that actually if we follow them, we might get to know ourselves better, to get in contact with our soul, to sort of mine our unconscious. That's but exactly it. how many BDSM practitioners have a, an interest in spirituality rather than getting their rocks off? A great question. And, you know, we don't have numbers uh, because a lot of people that are into BDSM and kink are uh, reluctant to come forward and self-identify or to participate in a survey. And that, that's becoming a bit less of a problem than it used to be, but only, I would say, fairly recently within the last decade. We've got a movement that we do know about that has a number of people engaging in it, which is known as pagan BDSM. And there's a really excellent book by a fellow in the United States named Raven Caldera called Dark Moon Rising, in which he, he goes into detail about the practices of pagan BDSM, which is overlapping spirituality with the practices of what he calls the ordeal path. And actually, I think what we refer to as the ordeal path goes way back into different cultures and religions from all over the world, where transformation comes both through erotic practices and also physically arduous practices. You can see this in the ascetic movement within Christianity. Within Hinduism, there's the Kavandi ceremony where they put in hooks 
and piercings on the body and hang weights and pieces of food off of it in their in their religious festivals and their parades. There was a flogging, which was very big, you know, not only with the Christians, but we have all the way back in ancient Greece in the ruins of Pompeii, there's a building that's called the Villa of Mysteries. And they have frescoes inside the villa, which depict some kind of an initiatory ritual in which the initiate is being scourged with what was called the thrissus of Dionysus. It was a, a staff with uh, pine cones on the end, but it was a form of flogging, scourging, that was part of ritual initiation. So what Raven was mapping out with contemporary BDSM is suggesting that this is a contemporary reiteration of something that people have been doing for centuries all over the world, and that it has this aspect to it that is really transformative through spirituality. So there are people that recognize it and that are practicing it. I also quote in the book passages from other writers like Joseph Bean, who I don't think that Joseph would ever consider himself to be a BDSM paganist, but his descriptions of some of his early experiences being flogged are clearly facilitating something very transcendent where he has an out-of-body experience. And he says, I floated away, peeled away from the body like a postage stamp off an envelope. It's a wonderful metaphor to describe. And he's not the only one. We've got quite a few people that have written about their experiences now where they go into these altered states. This is why I have a chapter in the book devoted to ecstasy. They go into these altered states when they're heavily into a BDSM scene with their partner. And so I think some of these things happen in a kind of, do you want to say accidental or organic, organic way that is part of what people are really after, whether or not they have the words for it whether or not they're thinking of it like as, oh my gosh, this was a spiritual experience. And what you say is that there are two things that depth psychology and BDSM have in common, and that is images and play. So that actually, really, these subjects of BDSM and therapy sort of belong together. So tell me more about that. First of all, with the idea of images, we come back to James Hillman in particular, first Jung and then Hillman. This is a point that they both shared. There's a point of deep convergence between them, that the psyche is fundamentally composed of images. That's how it speaks to us, isn't it? Yeah, exactly. That's the language. If you think about what dreams are, and Jung would say it's a meaningful sequence of images. It's not random. And Hillman would say images, he called them fantasy images, to be clear. But he'd say fantasy images are, I'm paraphrasing here, but it was sort of like the most privileged way of gaining knowledge about soul was through images. Because there's nothing that's more essential, that they are the ultimate given of psychological life. So when we are in the realm of psychology and psychotherapy, in the depth tradition, we're very interested in images and we're interested in holding on to what is being shared in the consulting room in a way that is non literal and holding what we call a metaphorical frame of mind because language itself has images embedded into it. When you get into the words that we are using, there's a history to all of those words and deep down within the history of each word, there's an image. The etymology, the root of the word, comes most often from describing some kind of image, right? So if we consider psychotherapy to be the talking cure, the talking cure is rooted deep within the soul in images, right? Now, when we come to BDSM, very often what is being experienced there has this numinous magical quality because it's nonverbal. There's plenty of play that is involving talk, for sure, <laughs> and very, you know, very provocative, very dirty talk sometimes, that that's part of what's arousing and exciting. But very often, if you talk to people about the headspace that they go into, 
they're going into a headspace that is much more what I would refer to as symbolic, meaning it, it's not entirely verbal. We're going into a realm where we can't fully describe what it is that we're experiencing. But what is occurring there is coming up very often through images. And what we talked about earlier with fetish, all of the gear is so rich in imagination. And the idea of creating an ambiance that very often, I don't know how many people take this for granted in 2024, but the space that is used to practice BDSM is called the dungeon. And I think we kind of take that for granted. You know, the dungeon is an image, and it's a space with a very rich history that takes us back to the Middle Ages and the medieval imagination, which is a time in history that was filled with its own images that are now reappearing and reemerging through BDSM and kink. And so this is looking at the archetypal dimension of what is coming forward in modern life in a reiteration of something that has been around for a long, long time. So I've spoken a bit here about image. The other word that you brought in in that passage is play. And play involves, it's very important psychologically. D.W. Winnicott, famous British object relations psychologist, said that psychotherapy cannot begin until the patient knows how to play. And if the patient doesn't know how to, now why would he say that? If the patient doesn't know how to play, then that's the first order of business <laughs> is, is to figure out how to do that. And what he meant by that is that we are negotiating in, in our psychological lives this space that is moving back and forth, toggling back and forth between an inner subjective fantasy world and an external reality. And play is the mediating function that occurs in what he called transitional space. There is a, a similar idea with Jung and Hillman in that there are these fantasy images that make up the life of the psyche. And then we have these physical bodies and these physical lives in which we bring forward these fantasy images in an embodied fashion. So I I hope that that can be clear that BDSM is playing in that same transitional space. And there's so much of the language around BDSM that uses the word play from the different kinds of sport and play from, I'm trying to think of some of the examples, you know, what we have cosplay and age play and impact play, you know, whatever it is that you're into, very often the word play is at the end of it. So from Winnicott, we've got play in psychotherapy because it's the place where new meaning and growth and possibility and new perspectives, new ways of looking at who we are and how we negotiate our way through life are all emergent through play and transitional space. And you see that same phenomenon happening in BDSM and kink, that something new and unknown is discovered perhaps for the first time. And what I find when I'm talking to my clients, and on the few occasions I do get them to talk about what turns them on, there is a great fear to open the door of something. So the fear is if you open the door, even though the world behind it might be a big cavernous one, and you could do something that would be really quite mild within it, like a bit of foot worship, for example, which you know, kissing feet and things like that is actually quite mild. But the feeling is that that submission, that in that room, there are sort of all sorts of horrible images that terrify you. So you have to slam the door closed before you've even sort of peeked through it and really actually thought, could this actually be something that would be creative, fulfilling for me, and also might be a necessity of the soul, to quote your book. How do you suggest that people get over that fear? When it comes to BDSM and kink in particular, part of what makes it unique is that you have a tremendous degree of control that is being paired at the same time with a tremendous degree of surrender and loss of control. So it's a very paradoxical space that we're talking about. 
But ultimately, if you are engaging in the practice in the submissive role, you always have access to a safe word. And before you use your safe word, and this is kind of iconic, it's almost, you know, become a cliche that people will use in, in a humorous or ironic way. But it's very important that before you get to the point of using your safe word, which is really the point of closing that door that you're talking about. I'm getting overwhelmed. This is too much for me. I'm freaked out. I'm scared. Can't do this. I want to go back. I want to close the door. You use your safe word. But before you get to the safe word, there are other coded signals that can be used. Sometimes people like to use the colors. Green means everything's good. Yellow means I'm um, not mm. sure I'm getting close to or it's too much. And red is holy smokes, stop. And the person in the dominant role will very often check in. And people can explore this, you know, without having to identify as, well, I'm a BDSM practitioner now, or I'm into kink, but I want to try this. I just want to, I want to see if we can bring in something new. And I've been thinking about this and been popping it up in my imagination as something that strikes me as kind of sexy, and I want to give it a try. But I'm also afraid if it's a person that who's going to be in a dominant position with you in a submissive position or vice versa. But the one in the dominant position can check in regularly and say, how are you doing? What color are you at? And, you know, sometimes this can be talked about ahead of time before you even get into playing, right? Just to say, what do you think this would look like? What do you think would make this a good experience for you? What is it that exactly that you're afraid of? What would help us build some guardrails around what we're about to do so that it'll feel safer to you? What are some things that might help you get in the mood? What are some of the fantasies that you have? If we just turned this into a story and played it out as a scenario that we talk about without actually doing it, what would it look like? Those are all ways to prepare it because you see, it begins in the imagination and we're priming the imagination, letting ourselves know it's okay. <laughs> we're going to enter into a space of exploration and discovery. And it's true. If we're really talking about discovery, we are approaching the unknown, and the unknown can be scary. Anybody that has enjoyed the thrill of a, a horror movie or a slasher film knows it's the, the unknown that terrifies us and that gives us the, the frisson, <laughs> right? But, you know, we like to be on the edge. We don't like to be overwhelmed. And now there's some people that really want the overwhelm. And that, that is something that can be negotiated and you can lean into. But I think your question is about people that are starting out. And what I'm really liking about this is the amount of talking that's actually involved. Because traditionally, I don't know what the Americans are like, but the English version of sex is get drunk and leap on each other. There isn't much talking. There isn't much discussion of consent or limits or anything else like that. Whereas just for something as simple as a foot worship scene, we could have quite a lot of conversation about it beforehand. And that is sort of, I think, empowering and creative. And suddenly we're getting out of that tired sex where we're doing the same old thing over and over again. And we're getting into a world of adventure. And that's, I think, is wonderful. Yeah, exactly. There's excitement and adventure and surprise. And the other point about talking, I mean, some people I think sort of laugh at kinksters and people who are in the BDSM because there can be so much talking. But, it, you know, really as a sexual type, there are a lot of people who are sapiosexual that are into kink and BDSM where the talking is almost as fun as the doing. I should say almost. <laughs> I, don't know. I don't know that everybody would agree with that. but. Communication also leads us to the topic of aftercare, which I, I really want to give a little bit of time to here and emphasize this because it's neglected, frankly, and it's an extremely important element of this, which is it makes it different from conventional sex and sexuality, right? Like, like you're saying, 
not only get drunk, get naked and jump on top of each other, but afterwards, let's pretend it didn't happen. Or certainly we're not going to talk about it. In BDSM and kink, it's very important to recognize that there is something that is being altered in the brain on a neurochemical level when we transition into what is called sub-headspace. And the dominant person has their own version of this with what is also known as top headspace. And there can be a tremendous amount of adrenaline. There can be a real endorphin rush. There's a very high state of arousal that can come with BDSM play. It makes it very intense, very pleasurable, very exciting, very much something outside of the quotidian, the everyday. But there can be a crash afterwards. And that is partly neurochemistry, but I think that it's also partly psychological, that people can be in a space where they are coming back into a more familiar version of their conscious life, and they reflect, and they say, holy smokes, what did I just do? What happened? And it's very important at that point to maintain the connection with the partner and to have a bit of time to debrief. Now, there are some people into kink and BDSM who say aftercare is overrated. There's too much emphasis placed on it. My aftercare is a cigarette, and please don't touch me anymore. (laughs) Fair enough. But I think that for people that are especially just getting into this and exploring, it's one of the ways that they receive some reassurance and some affirmation that this is something that can be integrated into the rest of the conscious personality and not remain something as a splinter, fragmented aspect of who they are, but that it's okay that you can explore these things. And as we were saying earlier on, from from the very beginning of psychoanalysis and analytical psychology, Freud was making the point that what he called polymorphous perversion It's not a bad thing. He said, we are all polymorphously perverse. It is a normal part of being a human being. So it didn't have anywhere near the pejorative connotation that it's developed in the years since he pioneered the field. And so the whole idea of sadism and masochism is that we all, whether we we are into BDSM and kink or not, all of us have to contend with the reality that sometimes we enjoy being cruel. And sometimes that cruelty is directed towards other people, and sometimes it's directed towards ourselves. But it's part of the normal human experience. And BDSM and kink is a place where that can be really explored and experimented with in depth and creatively. But coming back out of it, aftercare is so important to be able to talk about that and say, what happened for you? Here's what I experienced. And people can get very granular, which is something we typically don't do with our sex lives. Hey, there was a moment in there where it looked to me like something was happening for you or it was too much. And I wasn't sure if I was pushing too hard or not. What was that? And the other person might be like, oh, my God, I wanted you to go further. (laughs) But it's that kind of back and forth that illustrates how important communication is. And I would imagine plenty of stroking and cuddling and sort of almost the opposite of what you've been doing, that sometimes combining the opposites is very powerful. In a moment, we're going to be looking at a specific letter that I've got, and we'll be doing that in just a moment. The Meaningful Life with Andrew G. Marshall. Please follow us on Twitter, like us on Facebook, and visit our website, andrewgmarshall.com forward slash podcast, where you can join our supporters club and unlock bonus material and other benefits. If you'd like to submit a letter, and this one actually um, comes from somebody I know, You can uh, send a message to me via my website. If you go to www.andrewgmarshall.com forward slash podcasts, you'll find a section there that gets you a chance to participate in the programme. 
I'm in my 40s and since my divorce, I've began to readdress areas of my life that I shut down and ignored for a long, long time. Some things have gone smoother than I could possibly have hoped. I have finally admitted to myself that I am gay and told my ex-wife and our children. There have been some adjustments, but we're all doing really well. There is another level of self-discovery that I feel more ambivalent about. My desire for kinky sex, namely bondage, submission and some humiliation. I've put a toe in the water. I've been to a play party and talked with some players. I've done a light scene or two. But my question is whether I'm in this for healthy reasons. Growing up, I had a strong need to please. I come from a religious household and through my childhood and teens we went to church or church events several times a week. I knew deep down that I was different and that would not be appreciated. So I try to be really helpful, committed and likeable. I wonder how much of my desire to please a master ties in with my desire to please my family and the wider church. As you can imagine, I've had to deal with a lot of homophobia and self-hatred. Is BDSM an unhealthy way of dealing with these feelings? Could I still be punishing myself for being different? Are my new connections some sort of trauma bonding? Basically, am I escaping into hot but psychologically dangerous sex or learning something important about myself? It is such a wonderful letter, really. So ideally suited for our conversation, isn't it? I think it ties in with many of the things we've been talking about. Yeah. Which is why I asked him to put it together for us. Yeah, it's great. There are a couple, I think, kind of foundational things to cover in response to the question. Now, one of them is who gets to decide what is healthy versus unhealthy and how do we determine it? Mm. Just a little bit of history in answer to this question. If you go back to Europe and Germany in the 1880s, you have Richard von Kraft Ebbing writing this very famous encyclopedia called the Psychopathia Sexualis, which was the first time that anybody cataloged sexual activities that he considered to be deviant and pathological. Sadomasochism was actually coined for the first time, I believe. In, in that book, sadism based on the life of the Marquis de Sade, masochism based on the life of Leopold von Sacher Masoch. These were disorders based on the biographical lives of historical individuals. Freud picked up the terms wholesale, and they became an established part of psychology and psychoanalysis. Like we were talking about before, there were practices that today we might considered to be sadomasochistic, but at other times in history, they were spiritual practices, or they were part of what recreational play without it being something considered unhealthy. Just to highlight this point a little bit further, if we have somebody that comes into psychotherapy and they're really into rock climbing, or they're really into skydiving, there's a very high level of risk that is involved with those activities. People can come very serious harm, and it could even be fatal. But I don't know that anybody would ever consider those to be pathological. Somehow when we get into sex, we suddenly start to worry that it's unhealthy and that it's perverse in some way. Now, if we look at the DSM, the American Diagnostic Statistic Manual, and just to be clear, I'm not a huge fan of the DSM, which would be another interesting podcast, <laughs> but there are a few things about it that I think are worth referencing to help evaluate how, how any of us are doing, you know, in questioning, are we being healthy? Is this unhealthy? Am I hurting myself? Am I into something that's going to be bad for me? I mean, these are all really important questions to be asking about all areas of our lives, frankly, in including our sex lives. The DSM has become a lot more open, particularly in the latest edition. There were people from the BDSM and kink communities who worked with the different review panels that put together and edited the DSM for the section on paraphilias. So it explicitly states now that you could be into sadism and masochism 
and be part of a very well-established, well-structured community in which there's a high source of pleasure and enjoyment from those activities, and it does not lead to any impairment in other areas of life. And so they're not going to consider that as pathological. So they still have like a diagnosis for sadism and masochism, but you have to have some element of non-consensual harm. And that's different than hurt. You know, people that are into impact play want to have the sting and the burn that comes with the impact, and that can hurt. And there is a yes <laughs> that comes enthusiastically from their soul when they have that sensation and they want it. But harm is something different. Harm, we usually are talking about some either permanent marks, some Sometimes people want permanent marks, but a lot of people don't, and that's part of what needs to be negotiated. But if you have some permanent injury that you've sustained, and it was not something that you agreed to in advance, and sometimes those scars can be emotional, where you come away from the scene and you feel like, you know, that really messed me up, and I can't stop thinking about it. And now I'm not feeling like I'm doing so well emotionally where day to day in my life, in my other relationships, I'm having either a bit of a startle response or um, I'm feeling like I can't trust people or when people come in to give me a hug, I freeze up because the physical closeness now is too much associated with that bad thing that happened to me in the dungeon. And I think that those are signs that there was some trauma that was sustained. And because BDSM and kink are edgy, you know, edge play, there's that word again, play. Edge play is all about testing what the limits are. And there's a curiosity at seeing how far people can withstand a particular kind of difficult sensation or how much they can withstand a particular kind of psychological pressure. You know, things can go too far. But that is one of the reasons why we have so so much emphasis placed on negotiation and consent ahead of time and then a, a system of communication during the play to stop it at any point if it's gone too far and the person is feeling flooded and overwhelmed. So I'm saying all of this to try and give some reassurance and framework for the person who wrote this letter to evaluate that, you know, you're going to have to figure out for yourself, are you enjoying the hurt or do you feel like you're being harmed? And if it is really eroding your self-esteem and your sense of self-worth and your value as a human being, I think those are points of concern. Hopefully, there's another opportunity here because BDSM, I think like any other practice in life, you know, has the potential to do some real good. It has the potential to do some real harm, right? So it's not simply the practice itself that's problematic. And you could be talking with a master or a dom about your history and where you come from and the concerns you have about compromising and sacrificing too much of yourself in order to be pleasing, right? I think you said my desire to please my family in the wider church is something that now is getting reenacted, right? And there's a way that you feel that was harmful and that you, you lost too much of yourself and who you really are, right? Now, here in BDSM and Kink, we can have an aspect of the play that is involving reclamation, that now you're conscious. And the experience within a scene of being submissive or being of service for a limited period of time in which that is being pushed into the foreground in a very overt conscious way that's highly structured gives you a chance to revisit that experience where you're saying, I know I'm doing it and I know that I'm agreeing to do it. And then you can have aftercare to talk through what it was like to do it. It's very different than in the day-to-day -day experience of being within an environment where you think the people that love me are going to hate me and shun me if they know who I really am. And here you're going to get a nice great big hug afterwards and you can yeah. say when it's going to finish as well in the way that the, 
yeah. but with the priest, you haven't got that power. You can't say, that's enough humiliation now. Thank you, priest. Um, I think I'll go <laughs> home can I now. have a hug? <laughs> <laughs> Touche. <laughs> no, you really got it. Right. You know, part of the aftercare is the master Adam saying, you are such a good boy. I'm so proud of you. You really served me well. I was very pleased with your service. I mean, you hear, it's just that it's a very different potential there for, in psychotherapy, we call it a corrective emotional experience, right? So I think I have to recommend this book thoroughly to all therapists because it's going to give you two things. One, a great deal of knowledge about BDSM, but I think really whatever field that you practice in, actually seeing in depth how somebody else works and the frameworks they use can really be restorative to you and make you see your own practice in a different way. So I recommend it on that front. But if you've got a couple of sentences to give to depth psychologists, what would it be if they have a client in this area? It can be a tremendous relief to somebody who practices kink and BDSM to be seen and affirmed in their practices by a psychoanalyst or psychotherapist. We are professionals who hold positions of power within society. And a lot of people look to us as arbiters of what is healthy versus unhealthy. And so that alone, to be able to welcome and affirm somebody who, let's recognize they're taking a risk to open up you about what they're into. Andrew, I think you were sort of naming this at the beginning with where it still is an area that may be one of the last frontiers that our clients and patients really think, I'm going to be judged. My psychotherapist is going to focus on my kink as my problem that has to be overcome. And that is not why I'm coming to psychotherapy. It's not something that needs to be fixed. This is a part of my life that's working. And the last thing that I want is to come to an analyst or a therapist who's going to judge me and pathologize me. Or is going to be embarrassed by what I say? Well, yeah. <laughs> if they're going to experience discomfort, then how are they going to help me? Right? Just keep in mind that people that are into these types of relationships and activities are coming with a sense of risk about opening up about it. And so that is, I think, tremendously helpful if the therapist can be grounded and understanding and then you know, gain a bit of information about the practice. And the last thing I would suggest is to recognize, as I've put in the title of the book, that there is some kind of inner necessity that is being expressed here. And to become curious about what is it that is so important and so insistent that it emerge in this way that becomes the psychological question that can be incredibly valuable to explore. And if somebody's a kinkster listening to this episode, could actually understanding the psychological and the spiritual underpinnings of what they're doing actually help or deepen their sexual practice? That is definitely my contention, <laughs> that when you are able to understand that it is not simply the doing, the, the activities, the sensations, but that there's meaning that's being created around what you're doing. And you get more curious about what it means and what is being expressed and shared. And that it ties in with a deeper sense of who you are as a human being. And in some cases, it has to do with your personal history, that there is something that was unseen, unmet. Uh, there was some harm that was done in the past, and here is a chance to revisit that within an established container that's negotiated, that you're agreeing to, where some repair can happen. You know, all of that is extremely meaningful and potentially healing. But that comes with introspection and reflection and communication. 
Well, I'm glad you mentioned the subject of meaning because that's what this podcast is all about. So as a witness on The Meaningful Life, I have to ask you, what makes your life meaningful, Douglas? You know, I'm reminded of one of the things that James Hillman said about the soul, that the soul is what turns events into experiences. And I think that when we recognize that we are living an experience, life becomes more meaningful. And when we have an experience of depth and interiority, those are qualities that make life meaningful. For me personally, a life that is enriched by the arts has been something that I don't think I could live without. And so it is through going to symphony concerts, the symphonies of Gustav Mahler, or the, the novels of Dostoevsky, or the plays of William Shakespeare. Really partaking of, of that cultural life is something that's been profoundly meaningful. And then I think there's also the scholarly life, which is a life of contemplation and reading and deep thinking and engagement with the ideas of other people who have lived in other periods and where you really come into some kind of a dialogue or a colloquy with these thinkers of other times. And then you start to do your own writing. That is part of what makes life really profoundly meaningful. And uh, congratulations for taking it. This book of, it obviously is an academic book, but it is something that people that walk the ordinary streets can follow as well. And some of the concepts um, you put uh, very clearly, which I much appreciated. So that's where the conversation ends. But if you become a supporter of The Meaningful Life, the conversation continues. And we're going to look at pain and how our relationship with pain could um, do a little bit of a, a rethink. So um, if you want to find out about that, I'm going to be talking about my experiences with pain under the tattoo gun and how that's uh, changed my relationship with pain in uh, just a moment. But uh, if you want to hear this bonus material, you can subscribe directly via Apple or Spotify. And if you want to become a supporter of The Meaningful Life, and unlock the bonus material this way. Here are the details. You've been listening to The Meaningful Life with Andrew G. Marshall. You can follow Andrew on Twitter, like him on Facebook, and please leave a review wherever you consume your podcasts. Making, editing, and distributing The Meaningful Life comes with substantial costs, and we'd like to ask for your help. Visit our website, andrewgmarshall.com forward slash podcast, where you can join our supporters club and unlock bonus material for every program. Send in a letter to be discussed by Andrew and...